Honoured guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening and welcome to the University of the Highlands and Islands annual lecture. Uh, this year being hosted by Shetland College UHI. Um, the annual lecture event is hosted by a different academic partner each year and features a speaker who has either a connection to the region or who specializes in an area of curriculum particular to the hosts. In this case, music. Shetland and its college make an invaluable contribution to the fabric of our university. It does this with its diverse landscapes, maritime links, fascinating heritage, and thriving cultural scene. I'm delighted to welcome Midjur OBE as our guest lecturer this evening. Midjur has a long career in the spotlight. He joined his first band, age 15, and went on to play with a number of bands, including The Rich Kids, Visage, and Thin Lizzy. Although having performed with many bands, he is probably best known for his work with Ultravox and the now iconic song, Vienna. But he is also known for his humanitarian work. He co-wrote the signal, single, do they know it's Christmas with Bob Geldof in 1984 to raise money to alleviate famine in Ethiopia? And in 2005, he received an OBE in recognition of his contributions to alleviate suffering. We have had a very exciting 24 hours here, having been visited by our Chancellor, Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal, who joined us to celebrate successes of our students staff, and supporters. And now we have a giant of the music industry. But this is not all that Majur is involved in. To his considerable list of achievements, we must add his radio work, narration for television, books, both print and electronic, audio, and photography. To quote from his website, there are also oddities I seem to have been part of over the years. Alongside oddities, I hope to be part of in the future. Are we an oddity tonight? I will let Midge decide. If we are, I hope we are a kind one. I am delighted that Midge Jure joins us to deliver this year's annual lecture. As an experienced musician, humanitarian, and entrepreneur, I believe his lecture will give us inspiring insight into this transformative power of education. I will now hand you over to Tom Morton, broadcaster, journalist, and author, and well-known Shetland resident, who will be our host for this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Mulholland. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest speaker today is a legend who has changed the face of modern music, not once, but several times. I was watching a, a video interview with him the other day in which it just leapt out at me, a, a fact that I didn't know about Midjur, and that was the fact that he was responsible for the first ever use of colored vinyl in rock and roll records. And as I say that, I realize that even talking about records made of vinyl is probably a mystery to some of the people who are here today. He pioneered synthesizer rock music and pop music. And he was, I think it's fair to say, extremely daring in the appliance of the popular music frontman mustache. Midjur has been a trailblazer, great songwriter and performer, from Slick to Thin Lizzy, as you've heard, the Rich Kids to Visage and Ultravox. And there's also the simple fact that with Bob Geldof, he changed the world, literally changed the world enormously for the better with Band-Aid and Live Aid. And now that legend is here. 
In a moment, he'll be speaking, uh, and then, for about half an hour or so, uh, you and me and Midge will, I hope, be able to have a conversation. And uh, I've spoken to him. He's willing to answer any questions that you have within the bounds of decency and reason. First, though, please welcome, from Cambus Lang in Lanarkshire, via almost every major city on the planet, uh, most recently New York and the even better Glasgow, now in Shetland, Midjur. Not an oddity. It's, um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. It's fantastic. Um, as Tom said, I've just flown in from New York, where I've just done a, a grueling month's tour, and I mean grueling. Touring isn't, a, isn't a, as luxurious and, and uh, sophisticated as it might sound. I seem to have spent four weeks in the back of a glorified transit van um, with beds in it. Uh, that's how cool touring actually is. It's an absolute pleasure being here today. Um, I, I just wanted to tell you that I, I, you know, I have the best job in the world. I have the best job in the world, even though I've spent a month in a glorified transit van, because I chose that job. You know, I, I, uh, I had it quite... I suppose, in hindsight, quite hard back in the early days. You know, I was born in a, in a tenement slum in Glasgow, uh, outside toilet and gas mantles, you know, that uh, used to light the place, and more often didn't light the place because they were broken. Um, my parents slept in a cavity bed, which is a glorified hole in the wall with a mattress in it, in the sitting room. And my brother and I slept in the bedroom. And we used to scrape icicles off the insides of the windows. It was so cold, it was ridiculous. But it was a great growing up because my life was permeated with music. All we had was a radio. But back in those days, we only had one radio station and it was the, I don't know, the home service or the light service or whatever, it was the BBC and it would just play Everything from Frank Sinatra to, you know, bits of classical music to what was current pop at the time. And I drank it all up. I loved it. Music to me was like, um, it was like food for the soul. And possibly, in hindsight again, maybe music just filled your head with fantasy. And maybe that's what I needed, because the reality of what I was living in was pretty bleak, it was pretty grey. And music just took me to a completely different world. It was fabulous, I loved it. At school, education wasn't high on my list of things to achieve. I had absolutely no interest in education. Maybe I shouldn't be here talking to you about it, I don't know. Um, but not only would they not teach me something that I was remotely interested in, but in those days, they didn't see that I had any potential whatsoever. And the only things I could do was paint and draw and sing, because singing didn't cost anything. You know? So I was absolutely passionate about the arts. But it's, I don't know, it's, it's a bit like one of those sketches, you know, where the sun comes home to the you know, the Yorkshire miners saying, I want to write poetry. And he goes, no, you'll go down the mines like everybody else. It was kind of like that. So it was completely ignored, the fact that I was passionate about this stuff. And there was no outlet for it at all. You know, the idea of me suggesting that I might even try and go to the Glasgow School of Art would have been laughed out of the school. In fact, my one memory of primary school this was, when I was about, I don't know, maybe 10 years old, was my spinster Victorian-esque teacher pulling me out in front of the class. Uh, because not only was corporal punishment still okay back then, getting the strap or the things, your grandmother and 
parents will tell you all about that stuff. But um, humiliation was on the cards as well. It was all fair game. And this teacher pulled me out. And because I was trying to grow my hair, using up my hair quota, which I didn't realize at the time, I was trying to grow my hair into fringe at the front like one of the Beatles. And this teacher pulled me up for something. I don't know what it was. And she said, what's this? And flicked my fringe. She said, it's hair, miss. She said, you look effeminate, boy. Now, these days, you'd probably be put in prison for saying that. In those days, if she had told me what effeminate meant and maybe taught me how to spell it, it might have taught me something. But no, that was it. That was my one major recollection from primary school. So it was kind of obvious I wasn't going to be allowed to follow my heart's desire. My father was a van driver, he drove for a bakery uh, all his life, and probably hated it. You know, he did it because, you know, you do any job. You, you do it to generate money to keep your family alive. That's what he did. He wasn't skilled at anything coming out the, the, uh, the war, uh, except for driving. He could drive. But he instilled in my brother and I that we should do something skilled. We should be apprentice engineers or mechanics or plumbers or something, some, a skill, which was actually a very good job to have. And I managed to become an apprentice engineer at the National Engineering Laboratories in East Kilbride in Lanarkshire, which was a very tough job to get because there were 500 kids, 516 year old kids went for 10 spaces and I got one of them, mainly because my mother's cousin worked there and pulled a few strings, but I got in, <laughs> you know, I was there. I was going to follow this route that my parents had kind of instilled in me. Um, but all the time, music was there. It was always there. It was in the back of my head. I was a fantasist. You know, I dreamed of, wow, you know, get a guitar and play in front of an audience and girls liking me. You know, how cool would that be? You know, top of the pops, all of that stuff, you know. But the reality was, this was as good as it was going to get, you know, this apprenticeship. I was playing in a, in a part-time band all the way through the apprenticeship. I managed to do two and a half years or four years. And um, I went with one of the guys in the band that I was in at the time. He went for an audition as a keyboard player for a bigger band in Scotland, a band called Salvation. And I went with them. And while they auditioned him, they needed me to play guitar. He didn't get the job. They offered me the job of guitarist. Now I was 18 halfway through my apprenticeship, doing everything my parents wanted me to do. And I had a dreadful decision to make. So what did I do? I left the decision to my parents. I went home and said, here's the situation. You know how passionate I am about this. And I could see the look in my father's eyes, which was horrific, because he thought, I'm going to blow it here. And my mother, who was a feisty old trout, said, follow your heart. And how difficult would that have been to say that in those days? So I did. They didn't regret it. You know, they, uh, they saw many things happen to me over the next few years. Uh, things that they didn't understand because I was living in a different world. You know, the, the, the gold and platinum records and stuff, they didn't quite get it. They come and see me in concert and couldn't understand why all these people were clapping. But they did see stuff that they got. I think uh, This Is Your Life, the program that young guys, young people won't know about. It's a program that would just kind of come and pick various people in, you know, from all walks of life and a few celebrities and get you in front of an audience, a TV show, and they would talk about your life story and bring various people out you hadn't seen for years that you could barely recognize and, um, and embarrass you for half an hour. My parents were both alive uh, when that happened and that is something they understood. They understood that much more than anything else. You know, my mother lived to see me get the OBE and she used to watch the DVD that was made of the Queen pinning this thing to me 
She used to watch it every day. It was quite amazing. So I followed my heart. I followed my dream. I did all the concerts and, the, and I made all the records and I was on top of the pops. And when I realized I'd failed miserably trying to sneak a peek inside Pan's people's dressing room, um, uh, you know, I thought, I've kind of done it. I've done it all now. This is it. I'm doing the, the global thing. I'm traveling the world, doing all these concerts. You know, how cool is that? And then everything changed. Um, I got a phone call from an old friend of mine. I was doing a, a, a TV show in Newcastle, a music TV show uh, called The Tube. And uh, a friend co-hosted the program, a girl called Paula Yates, who was the girlfriend of Bob Geldof. And I got a phone call. Well, she got the phone call, actually. And she said, it's Bob on the phone. He wants to talk to you. And he proceeded to tell me about a piece of footage he had just seen on the BBC, a news report by uh, the reporter Michael Burke about a famine in Ethiopia. And he said, look, uh, I'm sitting here looking after the kids. Uh, the Boomtown Rats have gone, his band. He said, I, I want to do something, but I don't think I'm in the right position to do it. Will you help me? And for a split second, to be absolutely honest with you, I thought, I'm too busy. I've got a new album out. You know, I hadn't seen the footage at this point. I hadn't seen the, the broadcast. And I thought, I've got a new album. I'm busy. I'm doing this, that. I've got to go on tour. And I've got to do all this stuff, 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 stuff. Me, 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 stuff. And um, you don't say no to Bob, you know. So I, I met up with him uh, when I got back to London. And you have to imagine this, which is quite a, uh, quite a sad image, really. Two fairly successful songwriter musicians sitting for two hours trying to figure out what we could possibly do to raise money before it struck us that the only thing we're capable of doing <laughs> is writing a song. <laughs> we were skilled in absolutely nothing. So we decided this is what we should do. We can't just, you can't just do a cover version of an already established Christmas song because 50% of the money's earned from a record go to the writers. So we couldn't do White Christmas or something like that, you know, because the Irving Berlin, you know, trust would get the money. So we decided to try and write something. Um, I went home and sat at my kitchen table in London uh, on a, with a little toy keyboard, not even a real keyboard, a little toy Casio keyboard. And I played around with some sounds and I came up with a da 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 which I recorded on a, a cassette and sent, oh, a cassette is a little, <laughs> for you young guys, um, it's a little tape. And I recorded it on a cassette and sent it to Bob, who said, yeah, it's rubbish. It sounds like Zed cars. Ask your parents again, they'll tell you. <laughs> and I said, yeah, okay. He said, but it'll fit with, you know, whatever I've got. So he came over to my place a couple of days later with a guitar uh, that had hardly any strings on it. And he plays a right-handed guitar, left-handed. So all the chords were upside down and he proceeded to sing this thing at me. I thought, yeah, that's really good, Bob. And every time he sang it, it was different. So I recorded it on a cassette again um, and proceeded to spend four days in my studio putting these totally incompatible ideas together. Originally, he wanted a guy called Trevor Horn to produce the record, but Trevor, who was the, the hottest record producer at the time, uh, said it would take six weeks, which would have made it an Easter record, which is a bit redundant, really. So I started recording all the instruments and doing the arrangement, and I, I played all the stuff on the record, except for the drums, eventually. And while I was doing that, he was on my phone, absolutely driven, at this point, everybody had seen the footage. Everyone knew exactly what was going on. Everyone knew exactly why they were committing to something. While I was doing this, Bob was on the phone, bludgeoning people down the phone, saying, you're coming to the studio on such and such a date. Be there. And they all said yes. So there's a moment where... I'm standing outside the studio, which is the bit that we've all seen. Everyone's seen the footage of the kind of making of the record thing. And I'm standing outside the studio, and it's just Bob and I. And a sea 
of cameras. I mean, a sea of cameras, sea of microphones. And it's just Bob and I on a cold, wet Sunday morning. And Bob leans over to me and says, if it's just the Boomtown Rats and Ultravox, we're buggered. <laughs> I said, you've got a point. But they all turned up. Bearing in mind we hadn't actually spoken to an adult. You know, we hadn't spoken to a manager or a, or a record company or an agent. And some, somebody who might write down where and when this was happening. We'd spoken to artists. <laughs> and they all turned up. Even a couple that we didn't ask, so I don't know where they came from. Maybe just walking past at the time. So we made this record. We did this thing. We made this record. 24 hours we had to record Phil Collins' drums. All the vocal parts. Bearing in mind, nobody had heard this song. Nobody. They had no idea how it went. You imagine how intimidating it is for one of those artists to get it up on a you know, cold Sunday morning or whatever it was, stand behind the microphone with all these peers, you know, all leaning against the control room window, all looking at you, waiting for you to go, uh, uh, you know. Hideous thought. So we recorded all the vocals, all the choral vocals, and mixed the record overnight. I'm driving home the next morning. Bob takes the cassette to Radio 1, BBC. And I'm driving home absolutely exhausted. And I had the radio on. And I heard Bob on the radio on the breakfast programme. And they played the cassette. Unprecedented. They'd never played a cassette before on Radio 1. They played the cassette. And when it finished, they played it again. And I knew there and then something huge was happening. We thought we could raise £100,000, which was a realistic figure if we got a Christmas number one, because a Christmas number one, if you get to the charts, you get to number one just the week before Christmas, the charts freeze. So you're number one at Christmas the week before, Christmas uh, week, you're number one over New Year, and you're number one in January until the charts start to move again. So over those three or four weeks, £100,000, practical number. The entire industry gave up their profits. So the record company, the promoters, the pressing plants, the retailers, everybody all across the board donated their money. So the record raised seven million pounds, which is just huge. It never happened before. We even had Fortnum and Masons, the, the very, very posh, maybe Princess Anne's been there. Um, the very, very posh uh, department store in London phoning up asking how one sells recording discs. Because they'd never sold a record before. You know, how cool is that? We had butchers buying it and putting it in their window, selling it again. Not for profit, just because it was there and available. So you'd buy a pound of sausages and you'd buy the Band Aid record. It was just amazing. We formed the Band-Aid Trust, which is still going today. Uh, we're still doing this. Um, we originally thought it was going to be a six-month project. Uh, we formed the Band-Aid Trust, a body of people from the music industry, lawyers, managers, uh, promoters, who understood business to look after the money. The first piece of advice we ever got when we started doing this was from the Beatle, George Harrison who had tried to do it before with a concept of Bangladesh, and all the money all disappeared, all went on overheads. The whole thing just it didn't raise anything. And he said, get good accountants, which we did. Three months into this project, or prior to this, hold on, let me just tell you, I went to Ethiopia with the, um, with the initial aid shipment, high-protein biscuits and medication, all sorts of stuff. And at this point, the famine was becoming old news. It's the way the media works, unfortunately. It's human nature. Something else happens in the world, and the cameras go over there. And we kept saying, no, no, no. You've got to keep focusing on this. This hasn't gone away. So unless Bob or I went with a film crew and the, the initial aid, the emergency aid, um, it, the media was going to stop covering this. 
So I flew to Addis Ababa, where I have to tell you, um, naivety is a wonderful thing. You know, I'd seen all these images on television like you guys had. And uh, I turn up at the airport in Addis Ababa, and I'm taken straight to a luxury hotel in the middle of the city. And this city's like a city anywhere, buses and cars and people going to work and whatever. And I'm standing in this hotel that took me to freshen up. And I'm looking out the window and there's people sitting around a swimming pool. I thought, this isn't right. This, this isn't what I've seen on television. This doesn't make sense. They took me half an hour down the road in a Land Rover to an aid camp. They said, it's a small aid camp. And it's a children's aid camp. It's only got 6,000 people in it. And I went to this place half an hour's drive away. And, uh, and I'm looking at this aid camp, which to all intents and purposes looks like a concentration camp or a prison camp. Except the difference is at the top of the wire fence in a prison or a concentration camp, the wire would go in to stop people from getting out. The wire went out to stop people getting in because that's where the food was. It was horrific. I got there in the morning and they said, it's a good day, only three children have died today. So far. It was nine o'clock in the morning or whatever. It was hideous. And I came away from there thinking, I can't do this. Uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm a kid from Canvas Langer plays the guitar. That's it. You know, I'm not cut out for that. The people who deal with that stuff on a daily basis are phenomenal. These people have to stand in front of a line of adults holding their children and choose who they can help. That's not for me. That's just that's too big for any one person to do. I came away from there, dis decided I'd never, I'd never go back. I couldn't go back. And um, I carried on doing what I was doing, which I've done for many years. As I say, the Band-Aid Trust is still in existence. And the 20th anniversary of Band-Aid uh, saved the children, asked me to become an ambassador for them and go back to Ethiopia to see the difference. And I not only went back and saw the difference that this pound in your pocket that it cost to buy that record made, I met the difference. And I've been asked many times by journalists, you know, it's still going on. Was it worth it? Did it, did it do anything? Yeah, of course it did. I met the difference. I met children who survived those camps and who are now teachers. They're now adults. They're now they are children of their own. And uh, they are armed with the tools to try and combat what we now know was global warming. They have those tools. They have that infrastructure there that was never there before. So meeting these people was just astounding. When we did Band-Aid 20, we decided to re-record the record 20 years on with some of the new artists uh, because we wanted every generation to take that song and do their own thing. When we did this, Bob insisted we show a video that David Bowie showed at Live Aid rather than play one of his songs. He showed a video that the Canadian Broadcasting Company had put together uh, with a pop song. It's a, it sounds a really weird thing to do. This video of a, an emaciated child taking four minutes to try and stand along with the cars, who's going to drive you home tonight, which had nothing to do with famine. But when you put those two things together, it was incredibly powerful. And we decided to show the new generation why they were there. And we showed this. And it was a stony silence in the studio. And then we brought that girl out, who, again, you would have thought would never have made it after this video. We brought out this beautiful woman <coughs> who had survived because you guys bought that record, which is just phenomenal. Did it make a difference? Of course it did. 
It made a massive difference. It's a great story uh, I was told once, uh, two people walking along a beach. And um, as they were walking along the beach, they saw it was absolutely strewn with starfish, all washed up on the shore. And one person said to the other, that's dreadful. We have to do something. And the other one said, well, we can't. You know, there's, there's a thousand of them. The first one bent down, picked up a starfish, and walked over into the water and put it back in the water and said, that's one. And that's how you have to think of those things sometimes. You have to start. It's one step at a time. Things are changing. 60 of you guys have graduated today. I've told you that story because I was uneducated. My education started when I left school. Life educated me. You are armed with the tools to go out there and do something special. I didn't have those tools. And I just wanted to say if a couple of completely and utterly hapless musicians can get together and just tilt the world on its axis just a little bit. What can you do? It's all out there. And right now, we need your help. You know, we're in a fine old state. It's yours. It's like passing the baton over to you guys. You know, you have the skills. You need the ambition. You need the drive. You, need, you can move mountains when you're driven by something. I couldn't have done this for 42 years if I wasn't passionate about it. I couldn't get up there and stand on stage and sing bloody Vienna for the millionth time if I didn't love doing it. So what I want to say to you guys is, go out there. Be magnificent. Grab that moment. We're on the cusp of something wonderful and scary and bizarre right now. It's a brave new world out there, and we need you to pick up the reins and run with it. Thanks for listening. Well, Midge, thank you very much for that. It was uh, very powerful, and I'm sure everyone agrees, very moving. And uh, I think inspiring for uh, everyone who was here and listening. I wonder if I could take you back uh, to the beginning of your career, just that to fall. start thing off. When you weren't Midge, you were Jim, I think, weren't you? It was because there was a differentiation had to be made between a, a couple of Jims, and that's how you became Midge. Is that when right? I joined my that the band I was saying that I went with the keyboard player, and he didn't get the job. He ended up working on a ship somewhere. And they gave me the job as guitarist. Um, there were two brothers who ran the band, uh, the McGinley brothers, Kevin and Jim. And my name's Jim, James, Jim. And uh, a bit like that movie Animal House, you know, when the new frat members come in and they go, you're now called Fish Face, and you're now called Fat Head, and you're now, you know. It was kind of like that, and Jim said to me, well, we can't have two Jims in the band, it's too confusing, so you're now Midge. I said, why? He said, well, it's Jim backwards. So we just spelt it differently. There is, of course, a Glaswegian tradition of spelling names backwards, because Ang Ag Agnes, Agnes Senga. becomes Senga. Isn't that the case? Yeah, how bored would you have to be to come up? <laughs> Almost as bored as, well, working in a chip shop and thinking, oh, I wonder what this Mars bar's like if I dip it in batter. <laughs> who, who thought of that? And the answer is absolutely delicious. <laughs> <laughs> what struck me listening to, to you talk about your early years in, in music was how you basically acted, as you said, from passion, from a passion for music. But there will be people here who are studying music, who have that passion, yep. but who are involved in an academic, practical course in learning how to be successful. That's not something that you 
uh, undertook at all. No, I have to say, you know, when I when I um, when I started the music industry, I was incredibly green. I knew nothing. Uh, you know, I didn't. I, I had no no discernible skills. I I didn't write songs. Um, you started writing songs that were just basically rip off of someone else's songs. You know, whoever you were listening to, that's what your new song sounded like. I had no skills. I didn't understand publishing or copyright or uh, management or you know uh, self promotion. None of those things. Which maybe in in my day when you were signed to a record company, a record company would do all of that for you. These days, these guys graduating from here will have those skills. You know, you are taught about publishing. You are taught about where the money's come from. I had no idea. I was just, I was a gibbering wreck who was just happy to be on top of the pops. You know, that was, that was the furthest I could see. Making money at it was way down the, 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 the bottom of the heap. For me, it was the whole process of doing it, you know, get, being allowed to go out there and make music and play my guitar and show off in front of girls. It was glorious, it was wonderful. But don't you think that in some ways it may have become too professionalized? No, I don't think, you know what? You wouldn't send uh, an unskilled mechanic to go out and build uh, you know, uh, you know, an oil rig, would you? Well, why would you send musicians out who don't understand the elements of what it is they're actually trying to achieve? Um, especially in this day and age, because you do have to be a jack of all trades to do it. You do have to run your own you know, uh, uh, social media stuff. You do have to be able to produce your own music. You do have to do all of this stuff without going cap in hand to a record label asking them for the money to do it. Um, because they don't exist. They're not there anymore. So you have to create the niche. You have to create the job for yourself. There was a moment, and I'm going to throw this open for questions after this, so if you have any questions, uh, we, we do have a roving microphone. There's actually a person with the microphone who will take it around, <laughs> and, and please speak into the microphones, because this is being filmed and is being broadcast to at least... Yeah, don't be nervous now. <laughs> uh, well, it's being broadcast to at least seven people who are watching on the internet as, as we speak. So uh, that will be happening, I'd say. But there was a moment in, when you were talking about that audition for Salvation, uh, and you were the guitar player who shouldn't have been there, but you got the job. And that struck me as being a crucial thing. In, in you find it in all kinds of bands, in all kinds of moments, where there's a combination of charm, social skills, because you're there, because your pal's there, and in the end of the day, ruthlessness, because you acted and took the job, even though perhaps your pal was really disappointed. You think that's fair? I think it's fair because he went for the job as keyboard player, so <laughs> I wasn't really stepping on his toes. Um, and when I turned up to do the audition for Salvation, it turned out it was only the two brothers that looking for a drummer, a keyboard player, <laughs> and a guitarist. So, no, in that instance, no, I, I don't think I don't think there's ever a moment where I pushed somebody out the way to get to, to get to a microphone to to be in the in the front. In fact. If you ever, if anyone has the DVD of, uh, of uh, the Live Aid concert, there's a, there's a moment at the end where everyone's on stage. Now, I am actively pushing myself into the crowd of people on stage, while there's others who would elbow their granny out the way to get to the <laughs> microphone. Um, so, I, you know, I, 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 I kind of know my place, you know, so I've never actually done uh, anything like that. But there's a moment where luck certainly kicks in. And maybe if I hadn't, gone to the, that audition with the friend, I'd be driving a van like my father. But you're also somebody, if you look at your career, you're somebody who gets on with folk, aren't you? And that, that's, I mean, if you look at the different things you've done, playing guitar for Thin Lizzy, I mean, nothing could be different, more different from being in Visage with all these fashion victims and things like that. I mean, Phil Lynott and Steve Strange are very, very different people, aren't they? Weirdly enough, they were friends. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's, it's funny because, uh, uh, you know, all the music students who, who, uh, who have gone out there into that, that wonderful world um, uh, will find out that artists don't really tag themselves as anything. The media tags you as something. They say, oh, you're indie, or you're heavy rock, or you're whatever it happens to be. And they, they're the ones who put you on a little bookshelf. But when you actually find you're in the room with a bunch of musicians, you're all the same. 
You know, I was on tour earlier this year in, uh, in Europe uh, with a huge orchestra and a variety of artists. And there's a thing called uh, classic rock. And the headliner was Alice Cooper. And I'm on stage with Alice Cooper. I mean, where was it ever written that was going to happen? <laughs> But it works, you know, it, it, once you get to know that, that, you know, Alice Cooper doesn't bite the heads off chickens, he's a really nice guy, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's it, you know, it, 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 artists are just artists. Did you have a game of golf with him afterwards? I didn't, but he, I, I suspect he booked a tour so he could play golf. <laughs> you know, the music was almost secondary. I used to find that astonishing. He was a scratch golfer. Amazing. <laughs> okay, does MD have a question they'd like to ask, Midge? If you stick your hand up and then we can identify you and uh, move the microphone or the person carrying the microphone in your general vicinity. Oh, don't be shy. We have a very shy audience here. Uh, it's also, I think, it's oh, so there we go. There we go. Somebody at the there we go. The Hold on, the microphone's Brian. coming. Don't shout out. Hold on. Otherwise, those seven people watching it on the internet <laughs> won't hear what you're asking. Um, you, you, you might say like that the, the 1980s music industry was the, um, the height of decadence, maybe a symbol of decadence, which at the, the either end of the dichotomy was um, Africa starving. The irony of this two ends of the, the polar opposite supporting each other, that to me it's almost like uh, squaring a circle. How, how, how do you feel about the the fact that there was uh, the two extremes almost came together? It's uh, you're quite right, they did come together. But, um, you know, what Tom was saying about oddities, that was an oddity. Um, the whole, the whole Band-Aid thing was a phenomenon. It was, it was the exception to the rule. The music industry uh, is notoriously shark-filled and uh, notoriously self-centered and greedy. And for this one period, somebody had spiked their drinks. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but they, they all got it at the same time. But there was something real and genuine about that period. There was a six-month period between the Band-Aid record coming out and Live Aid happening. And for anyone who was there, you could feel it in the air. There was something real and honest and genuine about the concern. You know, maybe if you did it tomorrow, it wouldn't happen. And that concern wouldn't be there. You know, even when we did um, Live 8, you know, uh, a few years ago, it still didn't feel quite the same. Now, whether that was me looking back at Live Aid through rose-tinted glasses or not, I don't think so. I think there's something real and tangible that happened there, a genuine concern. But yes, it was, the, it was maybe the end of that particular era uh, where it was so self-centered, because everything changed after that. Um, part of the legacy of Band-Aid and Live Aid is the fact that young people got engaged with charity. It was cool, it was okay to do it because it was a medium they understood. You know, up until that point, I surmised that charity was something that they thought the grannies did. You know, it was the WI or, it was something you did with the Scouts or the Cubs or whatever. It wasn't, you know, wasn't perceived as a cool thing. But back then, music was the be-all and end-all. And they saw their musical heroes doing something for someone else. And it was okay to do that then. Can I just take you back to that day, mm. uh, which was an extraordinary for any of us who were watching at home on television. It, what I loved about it was the, the kind of the analog feel of it. And the, there were a lot of mistakes. You know, there were some stumbles. There were bands that failed. There was the horrific Adam Ant moment. Uh, there was all that. And then there was things like Queen, who nobody expected to be as unbelievably good as they were. You know, almost revitalized their career. Oh, uh, oh it most certainly did. Um, you know, Queen stole the day. I think U2 grew up that day. I think they became the band that they were destined to become. Um, they, ju they just embraced it. You know, certain bands embraced it and certain bands kind of shied away from it. And I have to say, and I, I'll be horribly honest here, my part was over and done with uh, in the first hour. So I went down to this artist's enclosure to watch some of the other acts. And believe it or not, I can be quite cynical. And I sat there watching, thinking, who's coming on? Mm. 
Elton John. Uh, not sure. And then Elton John would come on and you go, bloody hell, that was fantastic. That was amazing. You know, and I watched all these artists that I didn't really think I'd enjoy step up to the mark and become the artists that they had become. You know, they were just phenomenal, just unbelievable. And Queen, you know, Freddie was in his element. He was there, he had the audience in the palm of his hand, and he was brilliant at that stuff. So I think they kind of deserved their pat on the back, which was the fact that just about every record they'd ever made went in the charts the week <laughs> after. <laughs> It's funny you should mention Elton John because I was actually uh, looking at the list of best-selling singles ah. in the UK of all time yeah. since the Second World War. And Do They Know It's Christmas is number two, 3,750,000 sales. And number one is Elton John. How so many? 4,009,020. That's a lot of records to buy, isn't it, to, to try and beat them? It is. Um, there we go. Well, you know, if you, if you, you know, and I'm speaking as a record producer here because I produced the Band Aid thing. If you're going to be beaten by another record producer, let it be Sir George Martin. You know, <laughs> the man who produced, the man who changed all music forever. You know, uh, that's that's uh, that's not a bad person to be beaten by. But Ultravox have been produced by George Martin. We have they? been produced by George Martin, and I, and I describe George as a. Uh, as a cross between your father and your favourite school teacher. He's just this font of knowledge. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. Any more questions? Any, is that somebody with a hand on just scratching your head? Okay, that's perfectly permissible. Yes, here's someone here. Microphone, just... A man with a similar tie to myself. Here we are. No, not when you get close to it. Oh, okay. This is my old <laughs> college tie, actually. Um, I was thinking, sorry, I, I was thinking of joining a band with, with Tom because you'd have to become Mott Morton because my <laughs> name's Tom. <laughs> Mott Morton. <laughs> um, I think Mott Morton would go very well. You, you mentioned earlier on your, your school days, and this is about education and so on, and, and how nobody picked up what, what the, the skills you had, the enthusiasms you had. But you mentioned actually that it was drawing and art. So perhaps if they had picked it up, we would have lost a great musician because he'd have been an artist instead. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, you know what? I, 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 most artists, uh, musical artists I know, have a flair for graphics design. Uh, I think we're all we're all grown from the same seed. We just go off in slightly different directions. In fact, an awful lot of bands come out of art school. Uh, now, whether that's just being, being failed painters or sculptors or whatever, and it's easier to learn three chords on a guitar. I don't know. <laughs> But I think we're just, you know, if you're creative, you're creative, and it's, it's there. But the fact is that I just found it very odd that nobody, had, it, it, was, it wasn't on anyone's radar that I might be slightly different. I was a square peg in a round hole or, or whatever. But um, I kind of got there in the end. I was, just, I was just thinking that given our obviously joint advanced age, it wouldn't be Mort Morton, it would be Mort the Herpel, probably. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny you should talk about appearance. Uh, I mean, obviously you're a dapper, well-dressed well, man. I, I, I dressed for the occasion, yes. thank you. I don't, I don't walk about the streets like this. Well, um, but your appearance has actually been quite significant in all kinds of strange ways. There's a great story about how you were asked to join what would later become the Sex Pistols uh, entirely because of the way that you just had your hair cut. Uh, it's sad but true. Um, <laughs> I, w I was, uh, back, back in the day, you've got to remember, this is the, this is the mid 70s. And when bands used to come to the Glasgow Apollo to perform, uh, if the guitars broke or the keyboards broke or their amplifiers weren't working, the, 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 the infrastructure wasn't there to go and rent another one, you know, to whatever it was. So my management at the time uh, owned the Glasgow Apollo and managed Billy Conley. And, uh, and when bands would say, oh, this thing isn't working, they'd say, well, go and find Midge. He's usually around at McCormack's, the music <laughs> shop, around the corner. And uh, I was stopped just outside McCormack's by this English guy who, was, you know, who turned out to be the guy who was about to manage the band The Clash, a guy called Bernie Rhodes, who I didn't know. And he said, my friend around the corner would like to talk to you, you know, about music. And I thought it was to do with an amplifier or a guitar or something. 
and I go around to this parked car and I, I look in the car and there's the most bizarre looking person I'd ever seen in my life. In the mid 70s, it was Malcolm McClam uh, with his, his mohair black jumper and a dog collar. And that's not the sort of thing you wear in Glasgow. <laughs> and, uh, and he started talking to me about uh, his association with uh, the New York Dolls, a band in, the, uh, in America, um, his shop and his association with Vivian Westwood. Um, and this idea that he was putting this band together, blah, 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 and the conversation kind of went on for half an hour. And then he asked me if I'd join the band. And I realized he hadn't asked if I was a musician. <laughs> so I declined. I turned it down and, and stuck with, uh, with Slick. And of course, a year later, the band was the Pistols. So I never actually got to find out whether they wanted me to be a singer or a guitarist or, or whatever. And in fact, it has been streamed, but only seven people are watching it. They were in Glasgow with a boot full of slightly dodgy musical equipment. So I turned down the Sex Pistols, but I bought an amplifier. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My dark and sordid past. That's true, actually, because um, Steve Jones was famous for that, for, for lifting other people's equipment, wasn't he? I think, I think they were. I think, was it. I think that's maybe what funded the Pistols in the first place. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, here's somebody here, right at the end. Handy for the microphone. Hello, Midge. Hi. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed what you had to say. Um, I'm really interested in your childhood and the schooling and the way you were treated. What effect do you think this has had on your life today? Well, um, I don't think I'm particularly scarred by the effeminate remark. Um, uh, although, as I say, I think if anyone said that today, it would be, you know, a suable uh, situation. Um, you know what, I, I, it kind of was what it was. Um, you know, it wasn't until much, much later that I thought, hold on, how could they miss this? How could they miss someone who just was an oddity in the class, who was so determined to be, to, to, to do this? So it had this artistic flair that it must have been obvious to them. But maybe it was just a time when uh, it was the three R's, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic. And although it wasn't particularly bright, I knew that, you know, writing and arithmetic didn't start with an R, you know, it was, <laughs> but that's how they taught. It was, it, it really was Victorian-esque. In fact, the only teacher I had that, that cottoned on to the fact that I could paint and draw came from the islands. And I fell madly in love with her. I was 10 and I never got over that. So that probably forged my future <laughs> more than anything the old Victorian-esque monster did. Growing up in the home that you did and your you know, schooling or lack of it, how that has made you the man you are, what the you know, positive effects there are from that? You know what, I think, uh, I think songwriting comes from that. Um, I think uh, not a desire to get away from what I was in because I didn't know any better. You know, everyone I knew was in the same situation. They all lived in the closes. They all lived in these tenement flats. You know, they all had stagnant water in the, in the backyards. They all had, you know, uh, the, the same smells and hideousness that I had. So if everyone's got the same thing, you, you don't feel deprived at all. You know, the only people I, th I thought people who lived in bungalows were really posh, you know. But it, it, I also think that that kind of beginning creates something great. I think if you look over the history of music, rock music, pop music, populist music from the 50s, say, most of it comes from the working classes. Very few middle-class artists that I can name, I mean, Genesis maybe, they're quite posh, <laughs> uh, public school boys, but very few. Most of it comes from the working classes. It comes from deprivation. It comes from you know, being chased around the streets of Glasgow by gangs. It comes from fear. 
that comes from a desire to own things that you could never afford, um, not a desire to get away from your roots. Because weirdly enough, <laughs> although, as I know it's coming up, the referendum, <laughs> I'm not allowed to vote because I live in England. Weirdly enough, I still call Scotland my home. So that doesn't go away. That's always there. So I think that forges how you think and what you write in the future. So that's, I think that's a major part of what I've done. There was a thing, let me just tell you, that there was a, a dreadful moment of realisation because the music you were taught at school was traditional music, you know, so, you know, Step Be Gaily and all of that stuff, which I had no interest in at the time, I thought. And uh, many, many years later, I wrote a piece of music that um, I got Ultravox, the kings of all things, plugged in to do with the chieftains, the kings of all things unplugged, uh, the Irish, uh, Irish uh, Celtic band, the chieftains. And the moment they played the melody that I'd written, it was so ridiculously Scottish. It's the, obviously that musical input when I was a kid, I soaked it all up and it came out. And the moment I heard it on the right instruments, bang, there it was. So something did permeate this thick head of mine back then. I know your daughter's at university in Scotland. Um, is Scotland a place that you would consider ever moving back to? Perhaps you own a forest here, Mitchell, I don't know. <laughs> what, a tax scam? Surely not. Um, uh, you, yes, I, I, I'd come back tomorrow. Um, I, I had to move uh, from Glasgow to London back in 1977, I think it was, uh, because Scotland had very little infrastructure. Uh, if you wanted to be in the music industry, you had to be in London. So I spent 20 years in London and then moved to Bath in the southwest, where uh, I have four daughters. It's, it's God get me back to my wicked ways in the early 80s. <laughs> and um, until they are all gone, fled the nest, I won't be able to do anything. So for them, I couldn't move. Although weirdly, yes, you're right. My daughter's just started her third year at Edinburgh Uni. Uh, the first year, I think, ever to go to university. <laughs> so all those bleeding songs that I wrote have served some purpose. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Yeah, a couple more questions. So yeah, here's somebody at the front. Microphone wending its way to you. And may, I, may I compliment you on your facial hair, by the way? That's, uh... <laughs> I was just admiring yours too, uh, <laughs> Tom. Major, you mentioned uh, you know, um, the, the early days and how you, electronic music and how you've taken that forward. And you were also mentioning now about the record companies really not existing in the, in the same way they did. Is, is music more democratic now? It's, uh, it's more democratic. I think music is more de democratic. I think it's affordable. There was, a, there was a, not just a musical revolution back in the end of the 70s, early 80s, uh, but there was a technological revolution happened. Uh, so electronics, synthesizers, drum machines became affordable. You know, up until that point, uh, you know, a, a, a synthesizer took up a room this size and cost an arm and a leg, cost more than a house. Uh, so when Japanese synthesizers started appearing, you know, Roland and Yamaha and all of that stuff, artists could, could make music on their own, even though they didn't really know what they were doing, you could create a bass drum sound on a synthesizer and record it on a tape machine at home, and you could put echoes on that, so you could have a bass drum repeating a pattern. Then you could make a snare drum sound. It didn't really sound like a snare drum, but it did the job of a snare drum. And you could build up on a tape recorder in your little flat with one machine an entire track. So the punk ethos that had been there in the 70s with the three-chord guitar thrash bands had moved into electronics and you could start making records without having to go to record companies. So everyone had the same tools. Everyone had the same stuff. It's the 100 monkeys in the typewriter scenario, isn't it? You know, give everyone the same toys. The person with the idea is the one that makes something interesting. Whether you know what you're doing or not, a person with a good idea with a name, with an object, with a focus, they're the ones that will come up with something good. And unfortunately, 
we went through a massive period of everyone having the toys, but nobody having ideas, and they called it dance music. Oh. <laughs> what do you make of the whole uh, kind of financial, economic infrastructure of music now, where there's obviously, I mean, we're, we're even beyond the sort of piracy issue now. It's free. Basically, mm -hmm. there is a, 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 an attitude that music at one level should be free. Yep. You too have just given away their new album. They've given it away to Apple, to iTunes. Uh, so there are going to be 60 million people will get that album, which is an awful lot more than who bought the last album. <laughs> <laughs> Not, nothing, nothing to do with whether it's good or bad. Unfortunately, uh, it started many years ago. It started when uh, the newspapers gave away CDs. So music was devalued. It was cheapened. And now you're absolutely right. People don't buy music. You now have to think of a new album, a new piece of work as an advert to say, well, I'm still here and I'm touring. So you have to go out and back that up. You have to go out there and generate monies elsewhere. But that's what we were saying earlier about students coming out of here, music uh, graduates. They are armed with the facilities and the understanding that they might not be rock stars, they might not be pop stars, but they have a, an ability and a talent that could easily move into film music or music for commercials or, or, or whatever, you know, music for electronic games. Uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a whole industry out there that still needs feeding, still needs music. And once you understand that there are many different strands to this, not just I want to be a pop star, uh, then there's a future. There is still something lovely about the artifact, though, isn't there? Owning a thing which contains music. And I mean, for me, I, mean, I was talking about coloured vinyl earlier, and it was that story from when you were in the rich kids that you convinced the record company, uh, that as, as well as children's records that were multicoloured, adult records could be pressed in vinyl. It seems like such a small thing, but to me it seems wonderful. You know, the, the, the great thing of getting, I remember, a, a pink vinyl 12-inch pressing of Miss You by the Rolling Stones, which was just an extraordinary <laughs> thing to have. And I turned it into a clock, which I thought was the cleverest thing. And it was, it's now worth a fortune, but there we go. Not as a clock, incidentally. Uh, but um, in, in terms of actually owning things, the, you know, the, the trend now is the box set, which isn't just a box. It's got T-shirts in it. It's got posters. It's yep. got signed limited edition yep. artworks. The Small Faces just brought one out, which is, I think... Four hundred and fifty pounds to buy. Well, and, and is, is that a way ahead? For example, for your own work. I've heard many people saying in the past, um, you know, you cannot widen your audience, but you can sell more stuff to the people that you have. And uh, and I, I, I'm not sure I adhere to that uh, at all. Uh, but you're you're quite right. Um, I think you have to uh, market uh, what you do. Uh, if you're g giving away music that costs, you know, all music costs to generate. And it's still consumed at a huge rate. There was a great, uh, great example was that I listened to Radio 4 a lot. And this is re responsible for my education, Radio 4. Uh, I listened to Radio 4 a lot. Uh, and, uh, and there was a lady on there talking about her 15-year-old son. And she asked her son who his favourite artist was. And he said, don't know, like 15-year-olds do. <laughs> and she said, oh, come on, you must have a favourite. You know, it's, it's, who? You know, no idea. She said, well, what about you two? Don't know who they are. She said, well, you must have heard of you two. No. So she played him a U2 track. He said, oh, I know that. I've got it on my phone. Because <laughs> his friend had given him a hard drive with millions of songs on it, you know. But no idea, no connection, no, no relationship to the artist. Uh, they weren't fans, they just liked a song. It was just a song amongst millions of others. And we lost something somewhere when we stopped having 12-inch vinyl. Because you could walk down the street with a new album like this, with the sleeve facing out, and that defined who and what you were. Just that. And then it dropped to, you know, a little CD, which wasn't the same. You couldn't walk about with this thing. And now it's just in the ether. 
Right? It doesn't exist. There's no physical product. So it's interesting, I think, that young people are now starting to seek out vinyl. They want to have this weird 12-inch piece of plastic again. And maybe it's gone through a phase. Maybe it hasn't. Who knows? Can we just a quick informal survey? Who here still uses vinyl? Plays music from vinyl. Oh, determined thrusting of hands up there by people who preserve. That's, that's a fair vinyl. percentage, I'd say. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's pretty good. That's pretty See, I've got, I've got a turntable in my loft, and it's been there since 1986 <laughs> or something. I was amused to see that um, Apple have had to issue instructions to many iTunes users on how to erase the U2 album. Which, which people decided they didn't want after all, even if it was free. Any more questions? Yes, here's somebody here, right in the middle. Very microphone inaccessible, but we'll... Oh, no, it's okay, that's okay. Hi, uh, do you think you'll come to Shetland on tour? Shetland's on tour? You know what, for the, for the last 30 years, I've been banging on about coming up and doing something, because I do, I do little one-man shows, little acoustic shows and things. It's, it's quite an easy little package to take around. And for 30 years, I've been told there's nowhere to play. <laughs> I am now proven wrong. <laughs> this would be ideal. <laughs> Is that an invite? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to fund it, mind <laughs> <laughs> Play. That'd be good. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I'm sure that will happen, and uh, as a result of your question, which should be, which should be tremendous. Okay, I think we've got time for maybe one more. Is that is that fine? There's a hand way over there in the dark. In the dark. Over. Oh yeah. Yes. Yes. Merging into the uh, into the seat fabric, but we can just about see you. Yes. There's the hand. <coughs> Uh, in many ways, you've already answered this question, but for young students and graduates and artists, what would be the key advice or motto that you would give to people now, right to the beginning of their career? Uh, in music, yeah. Write, and then carry on writing. And then when you're tired writing, write some more. It's, it's the key to everything. You know, you can, if you can write the songs, you don't have to be the guy behind the microphone in the spotlight doing it. So, and th there's, no, there's no way you go to learn how to write songs. You know, I know, that, I know that certain degree courses try and teach songwriting. And I think they can teach the mathematics of songwriting. They can teach how you make the lines the right length and the verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle section, intro, da, 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 you know, all of those parts, the Lego pieces of songwriting. But when it comes to actually writing a song, you have to start by a little bit of plagiarism, start by not being very good and grow into it. You know, I didn't really think I started writing songs until I, I met the rest of Ultravox. Uh, I had tried many times, and I think you could probably, like, carbon dating them. You know, you could say, oh, you were listening to David Bowie at that point. Oh, there's a bit of Roxy music there. Oh, that's what you... And you could point all the influences. But when I joined Ultravox, it was like all of that had kind of gone. And we wrote Vienna. There was a... <clears throat> the gap between Slick's Forever and Ever getting to number one in 1976 and Vienna not getting to number one, for obvious reasons. It's only four years. Four years. S same kind of gap that the Beatles had between writing Love Me Do and Sergeant Pepper. You can grow up an awful lot in a short space of time, given the right vehicle and the right circumstances. Um, write, write, and write again. Just keep doing it. And don't let anybody tell you you're not good enough. You know, otherwise, we never achieve anything. Well, I'm sure you'd like uh, me to thank Midge for coming all this way. Flew from New York uh, via Glasgow to, to make this speech and to answer your questions. It's been inspiring 
and fascinating. I'm sure you'll agree to listen to his story. And uh, I hope it will have an effect on all of us who have been here today. And that you'll get a booking as a result. <laughs> mid year ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you. remains for me to welcome to the stage, uh, just to wind up proceedings, the principal of Shetland College, UHI, Irene Peterson. What a day it's been. This has been a really special day for Shetland College as part of the University of the Highlands and Islands. It's been a day of firsts and new beginnings. We've been honoured to have had our new college extension opened out at Gremista by Her, by Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal. And we have also had the first graduation ceremony of the University of the Highlands and Islands to be presided over by the Princess Royal in our capacity as Chancellor of the University. It is also the first time that the University's Foundation Day has been combined with a graduation ceremony. In this wonderful venue, Muriel, it is appropriate that we have had the pleasure of having a Scottish musical legend in the form of mid -Jewer, as the UHI's Foundation Day annual lecture guest speaker. My sincere thanks go to Midge for taking time out of what must be a very busy schedule to be with us today and for your very, very inspirational presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it and I'm sure everyone in the audience did too. It was, it was wonderful. Thank you. My thanks also go to Tom Morton, who was not only Midge's insightful interviewer, but you've also handled the audience questions with aplomb. Thank you. <laughs> On behalf of the UHI, I would like to express my thanks to Shetland Arts Development Agency for providing us with a very fitting venue for our graduation ceremony and for tonight's annual lecture. Finally, I wish to thank you, our audience, for your contributions to a memorable 2014 UHI Foundation Day lecture. Thank you and good night.